everybody. How you doing? I like that. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here today. Before I begin, I want to just let you know my name is Stuart Schlossman. I, too, have MS. Long saga on that. You want to know about it? You'll see me later on, all right? But right now, we need to get started with this program. So for today, though, I want to thank Santa Fe Genzyme. Hope that you all as well. They gave us the grant to do today's program. Clap. Come on. I want to hear it. You don't have to be announced. We don't got to do it like that. It's going to be like a revival here today, all right? Next, we have our final speaker of the day, and a lot of you are here to see Dr. Walker and what he's going to be speaking with you about. You know, we have um, a lot of our programs these days are about other things to do with multiple sclerosis, having not much to do with the medications, but there are many other aspects concerning multiple sclerosis. And those are the different series that we've been doing around the United States. So before I have Dr. Walker come on up, I want to tell you a little bit about him. It's a lot a little bit, but I'm going to keep it a little bit back, all right? Dr. Al Jolson Walker, Associate Professor of Neurology and Ophthalmology, Director of the Multiple Sclerosis Program, Director of General Neurology Division, Medical University of South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. Dr. Al Jolson Walker, MD, is a clinician, educator, and researcher in the Department of Neurology and Ophthalmology at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. He has been a member of the faculty for more than 25 years. Three plus years ago, made the director of the MUSC Multiple Sclerosis Program while working in the area over 18 years. During his time in multiple sclerosis, he was primary investigator or sub-investigator for numerous studies. He's taken the opportunity to extend his skills and experience throughout South Carolina, given multiple, given numerous lectures, and serving as the second and third opinion for difficult cases in multiple sclerosis and other demyelinating disease. He has worked diligently to improve the standards of MS and neuroophthalmic standards of care in South Carolina and beyond. Dr. Walker is a specialist in multiple sclerosis, demyelinating disease, headache, and unexplained vision loss. He has participated in numerous studies in multiple sclerosis, memory loss, headache, and vision loss. He's also published in all the aforementioned areas. Let's welcome Dr. Walker. Welcome. For a number of you, I recognize you and thank you for coming. For those who know me in advance and those who haven't met me yet, hopefully you have a good, informative, somewhat entertaining opportunity, if you will. For this particular presentation, one of the key things to keep in mind is that we'll be discussing sort of the interaction between you and your physician and sort of how to get the most out of that, if you will. And so we have a number of slides to sort of inform you of certain aspects of neurology, certain aspects of MS as a whole, and sort of that interaction thing from a neurologist's point of view who specializes in the area of MS. This slide is my reminder. It's sort of like that first day you sat down with your neurologist You've done all the testing. You've had the MRI done already. You've potentially had that spinal tap done as well. And now he or she is going to give you the answer. You want the answer, but then you don't want the answer because for some of you, you've done the Google. And you think you know the answer, and he or she is going to confirm that answer for you. And they tell you what you don't want to hear and become sort of a cloudy day, if you will, to say the least. But then, how do you relate to that healthcare provider? Because one thing that you guys don't really sort of think of is this. When a person is in medical school, a lot of us were biology majors, chemistry majors, bioengineering majors, and so forth, and we understand science. We understand the terminology attached to that. In medical school, we're taught to speak and understand medical language and diseases accordingly. But we aren't necessarily taught to understand you. And so when you come and sit before us, you are telling us what you experience, what you feel from your perspective, using your words. As you are speaking to us, we are converting your words to our language. 
Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. And that's where this sort of situation occurs, if you will. When you're looking at the provider, that person can be a physician, neurologist, ophthalmologist, family medicine, internal medicine, a number of different individuals will participate in your care because not everything wrong with you is related to your MS. Sometimes it's high blood pressure, sometimes it's diabetes, sometimes it's some underlying heart circumstance, renal problems, urinary problems, and so forth. So your team would be actually formulated with a number of different specialists as part of your healthcare team, if you will. The language you use will be similar in each of those circumstances. The APP is another way of saying PA or NP, nurse practitioner or physician assistant is APP. Advanced practice practitioner. And then your team might include physical therapists, occupational therapists, but once again, the point being is that when you're speaking that language, understanding your team, these are individuals that may in fact involve in that care. And the problem that you run into is this. You're trying to relay 20 years, 30 years of your life story, and the issue is time. How do you do that in such a concise way that this individual has the time to take your care your story in mind. Once again, time is that issue. And so in modern day, this is somewhat part of the answer. Typically speaking, when you describe things with your friends, you start off in the form of a story. It began here, ended here, this was the outcome, this was what was done about it, the conversation, the story. Then there's the list, and then of course in modern day, since it's difficult today to purchase a cell phone that doesn't have video ability. And so the point, therefore, your cell phone can function as the video recorder if necessary or provide other data. And so the key thing to monitor time is that when it comes to that conversation, it needs to be ideally focused. What you may notice is that when you are in fact speaking, you will stop and that physician may say, okay, so when was this? How long was this? When did it get better? What did you do about it? Was it at X level of difficulty? He's then quantitating what you're saying to him, converting it to medical language. So therefore being focused is ideal. And then it comes to the list. Oftentimes when patients bring me a list, what they will do as they think of things they write on, the, on their list, not unreasonable, ideal. But here's the problem. If you don't prioritize the list, the thing that's at the number one position, two position, three position may not be as important as the thing at the very bottom. Time may run out and the one thing you particularly want it taken care of isn't addressed at that visit. So therefore, prioritize your list, if you will. Then there's the video. It must be directed, right? Meaning that, imagine going to a movie, beautiful actors, actresses, support staff, no director. Hmm, probably won't go very well. And so when you bring video, it's okay if the video is a little shaky because we understand the idea of tremor. But on the other hand, on the way, you're seeing, oh, look, look at my grandchild. Oh, my God, look at him. He's so cute. My goodness. Yeah, awesome. Oh, yeah, here's what I really want to show you. Not that I'm not entertained by the little one, but we're running out of time. And that's when that fixed entity in and of itself. So once again, be directed when you're doing video, if that's what you want to do. It works. Then there's the witness. It is infrequent that any patient presents before me without a witness. Who's the witness? The witness is that caregiver, that loved one often, sometimes your child, sometimes your spouse, sometimes your parent, a parent, sometimes your best friend, 
in a number of individual functions as the witness. They are the verifier, meaning that you come in and you're trying to explain to me how bad your issue is. In the event I sit back in my chair, I say, hmm, I suggest reduce concern, the witness wakes up and then starts to chime in and validate how bad this problem is and add to it. Or the witness is there for a different reason. You come in, your significant other is fully aware of the fact that you tend to downplay things. The witness is their person to make sure that you actually give out the full list and validate it to its full maximum degree. The witness. Once again, ideal people. Very helpful because sometimes what happens is when you're the individual with the problem, sometimes you are not a great witness of your own problem. So therefore, someone outside of that can be ideal, very helpful, to say the least. But what are you talking about? What is this witness trying to uh, discuss? What are you discussing? This is a so relatively reduced list, but it sort of hits the big points, if you will, meaning vision, fatigue. In fact, fatigue is the two position here. It really should be number one. It's the most common reason that people are out of work, fatigue. And it's the one symptom that you cannot identify radiographically. It is something that the patient describes, talks about, and you just sort of observe and aware of it from that point of view. But from the point of view in terms of identifying a lesion, a number of lesions, location-wise, you can't find it when it comes to fatigue. Vision, bladder issues, pain issues, all these things are important components of each of you by different degrees. Some of you have no pain as a problem. Some have mainly numbness. Some have cognitive issues. And originally, when I started some 20 plus years ago, as a neurologist working in this area, we didn't really address the cognitive issue as a primary problem. Now we understand the fact that 10 or more percent of people present with cognitive issues as their primary problem, not walking, talking, but actually cognition. And then, of course, there's a the muscle and the spasms and there's other associated difficulties, which all of which can be debilitating to their own degree. This graph is an attempt to give you what MS looks like when you're on no medication. That's why the term natural history sits there. And, and, and once again, each line has a different meaning, but the key thing is that when you're looking at the pink line, at least from my perspective, it's pink, that line represents your new symptom. When you're talking about remitting, relapsing, multiple sclerosis, you have a new symptom. Look at the arrows in the bottom. Those arrows represent a new lesion. What you may notice is that there are tons more lesions than there are clinical symptoms. We often will hear patients say, you know what, I'm going to watch myself get treated based on symptoms only, not understanding that statistically for every one symptom, five to seven new MS plaques occur, okay? And so if you use symptom management, you're gonna miss a lot of the things that are happening in your head. Medication tends to reduce the number of MS lesions, therefore reducing the number of MS exacerbations, okay? And this graph is just for the point of view, just giving you the idea that multiple sclerosis as a whole actually formulates four different types. And the majority of people have remitting, relapsing MS, which is row number one. Meaning that you have an attack, and for the most part, you recover very close to your original baseline. And that's what the whole point of number one. And number two is just simply that people over time move into this version of MS to which they will have very little in the way of an exacerbation, but they get a, just a little worse, a little worse, very slowly, 
very gradual with MRIs that shows no clear-cut lesion per se. What you may monitor there is actual shrinkage of the brain itself. Brain atrophy may be a better marker, if you will. But once again, that's secondary progressive. And then progressive relapsing is a very small, small group, rarely seen overall, 5% of the people, meaning that they, for the most part, get worse, 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 but have occasional clear exacerbation. And then, of course, in the very bottom, primary progressive, meaning that they just simply get worse. No clear-cut defined symptom, just progression in and of itself. When it comes to multiple sclerosis, how is it monitored? For the most part, it's you. You are monitoring it. You're, your family members are monitoring it. You're giving us a history that tells us that, you know, Dr. Walker, since I last saw you, I feel no different. I'm doing well. I'm doing the same. Ideally, your witness will concur. And then I will examine you to see if the exam agrees with the previous exam. And then for anything that we might have missed, we order typically the MRI. What you may notice on this slide, I've actually enlarged the word contrast versus the non -con or no contrast. Why? When that, uh, the IV is placed, the contrast is given. The contrast will collect in those scars, if you will, or plaques that are recent, no more than two to three weeks old. So therefore, it will mark the very new lesions if you get the contrast. So very helpful because often you're going to ask the question, one, do I have any new lesions? Two, is anything active? And with the contrast, we can very easily answer that question for you as a routine. So therefore, a contrast is important. How many of you heard of JC virus? Most of you. Very good. Very good. The reason why it's here is because for those of you that are on some of the newer agents, some of the older agents as well, the JC virus or John Cunningham virus comes up as part of the conversation. Because as you well know, about 60% or so of the population has this virus already in their bodies. And if they are immunosuppressed, their white counts are dramatically brought down to a substantial degree, occasionally this virus could therefore activate. And as part of that activation, you can develop something called progressive multifocal focal leukoencephalopathy, PML, as we usually abbreviate it. And that particular infection is often fatal. And so as a result of that reality, we monitor the presence or absence of this virus on a routine basis in the MS patients on certain medications. Otherwise, you really don't need to do so. And this slide just gives me an idea of, okay, so doc, how did I get it? And basically, uh, oral droplets and so forth. And I can say some people are clearly resistant because, as I mentioned to you earlier, only 60% of the population is JC virus positive. 40% is not. Okay. So after you were informed that you had MS and you're in that same cloudy day, everywhere you looked, you saw MS, 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 MS. I need an MS center. <laughs> And once again, the neurologist, PA, NPs, ophthalmologist, physiatrist is the physical therapy, end of the physical medicine rehab component of it. Urologist as well for those who have urinary issues as part of their issues or sexual dysfunction issues as part of their issues and concerns. And the key thing to remember there is this, is that there are only a small number of actual MS centers, but there are a number of neurologists who what we consider specialized in multiple sclerosis. And so they themselves, in my, from my perspective, the majority of their practice or large percentage of their practice is composed of neurologists who treat the population of individuals on a routine basis. And then with that, they're keeping up because as you guys are well aware of, even as March of this year, we have another MS medication. And so every 18 months on average, seemingly, at least recently, we're adding a new medicine to the armamentarium, which is awesome. But with that, 
they're more different complications, different side effect profiles, different patient population as well, different concerns. And so that doctor or physician who is working with you on a routine basis, who's keeping up and you're keeping up, then it tends to put both of you on the same page most of the time. And for patients that I see, most of them are aware of the fact that even though you're not changing your medicine because it's working well for you, but we still discuss the newer medications so that you are aware of them. And it gives you the ability that, hmm, maybe I might consider it at some point in time, but right now I'm doing great, so I'm not gonna do that. But you're still staying in front of the disease as much as you could, and that's the whole point of it, and that's the idea. When you're attempting to identify the right doc, the right circumstance, the right situation that's working for you. The goal here is to identify a circumstance to where things are being considered. So when that physician is sitting in front of you, ideally you are sitting in front of him or her, you're looking at the things we consider comorbidities. What else is going on with me beyond that multiple sclerosis? What are issues am I having? What is the severity? Some of you ask, how many lesions do I have? Do I have two? Do I have three? Do I have four? You're, you're counting. And then sometimes you're reading your report, and in the report, all you see is the abbreviation TNC. Too numerous to count. We we'll often be pr printed there as well. And then you are wondering about risk tolerance. You're looking at and concerned about child brown potential, because some of you are 18 to 35, some are, some are older certainly, and can I have children? And the answer to questions, reasonable questions, reasonable answers for that as well. And then of course, JC virus positive and negative, we mentioned earlier, earlier. And then is your immune system otherwise normal? And so this idea of immune competence, if you will, as part of that impact. And then you get into the issues around also, can I afford this medicine? A lot of you would Google the cost of some of this stuff and thinking, my God, how does a person afford this? But interesting enough, it happens. People can't afford it. It, it works out. And then on the other side of the page, there's the treatment component of it. And you're looking at immune impact, meaning that as a physician, am I going to suppress your immune system so much that now I put you at risk for other more common problems like going from a common cold to pneumonia or the flu in a very dramatic way that can be fatal. And so these things are also considered as part of that equation as that concern that comes up from time to time as well. And there's always this risk benefit, meaning that you're looking at the side effects, you're looking at that patient's lifestyle, you're looking at the fact that they have small children, you're looking at the fact that they have a spouse, you're looking at the fact they have a close-knit family or, or they don't, you're looking at all these logistic issues, they, they reside in a place two, hour, two hours away from your location. So all this sort of goes into that equation trying to determine what is the best treatment protocol for that patient. Fortunately, because we now have medications that are given once every six months, once every five years, once a month, once every other day, once every day, that kind of thing, we have all these different options. These other things can truly be considered, which is sometimes particularly important for a particular family, particular person. And then the degree of MRI changes. Are the MRI changes in the brain alone? Are they in the spinal cord as well? Are, is it more spinal cord than brain? Is it brain stem and spinal cord? What's the significance? The significance is this. If most of your lesions occur in your brain itself, it's not that you don't have symptoms, it's just that the symptoms more so go unnoticed. If your symptoms or lesions occur in your brain stem, those symptoms are often noticed and persist. If those lesions occur in your spinal cord, those lesions are noticed because the symptoms also tend to persist as well. So the point being is that location dictates to a large degree persistence of symptoms versus resolution, more often than not. And that's why the MRI makes a difference in terms of what you might treat a patient with as well. Then it's the safety issues. 
Some of the medications have liver concerns. Some of them have white, simply white count concerns. Others have different potential cancer concerns and so forth. And so as you're deciding on your medicine, your treatment plan, then one has to consider how risk averse is that patient or are you? Some of you decide this sort of thing in, in the, on the front end. If I mentioned that this medication might give you breast cancer, you're like, oop, not doing that. And that's okay, because it makes it simpler. That one's already eliminated. Now we got the other 11, 12, 13 to go through. <laughs> and so, but the point being is that if one knows thyself, then it makes it a lot simpler, a lot easier, because the key thing here is this, adherence. If you don't trust the doctor, you don't trust the medication is safe enough, you're not going to take it. And I would guarantee you this, if you don't take it, it won't work. <laughs> and I have a number of patients that would come to me and admit to the fact that their refrigerators are getting so full that they can't put food in it. And I ask the question, so why is it full or what? Oh, well, I didn't take X. And it's accumulating, but then why'd you put it in the refrigerator? Well, I say refrigerate. Well, but you're not taking it. Well, I might take it. But, oh, but doc, it costs like thousands. I can't just put it out in the street. Oh. And then someone else gets it because it's actually got my prescription name on it. If someone else gets it, that's a federal offense. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I can't give it away. But the point being, guys, is that you're ideally trying to create this scenario to where you've created this individual practice plan, treatment plan for this patient, and you're taking all this stuff and create these building blocks, if you will, and then come with a plan that's individualized to them. Each of my hundreds of patients, when it comes to their MS, has a very individual treatment plan specific to them. You have to do that because each person's interests are different. Plus, since I've been there so long, their interest and concerns when they were 19 are different than when they're 29, different than they were when they are now 39. It changes. At one patient, she had young children, and her goal was to be sure to be there when they completed high school. She was successful. Then they attended college. Her next goal was to make sure she was there when they finished college. Now her goal is grandchildren. But the point being is that each individual will pick something that's important to them, or a number of things that's important to them, and ideally we then develop this treatment plan, treatment protocol that works for that group, for that population. And that's why it ends up being a very individual sort of practice plan, practice design. For example, you're 19. You, in fact, are interested in having children soon. What's the first medication that I might, in fact, offer you yeah, from that point of view? Probably one called Copaxone. Why? Because it's category B in pregnancy. So it's actually safe in pregnancy. And so it makes sense from that point of view. But then you say, but doc, I can't take a shot. I, I can't, I can't, uh, doc. No, no. You try to have a convulsion in front of me. <laughs> And then I said, well, guess what? When it, unfortunately, when it comes to the issue of pregnancy, the only one that's clearly safe is that one medicine. It only comes in a shot version. But the good news is this. It was every day. Now it's three times a week. Doc. <laughs> but once again, this is the sort of conversations that, you, that we have. And the good news, too, is that for most people, once you are pregnant, during the course of that pregnancy, Usually, you don't have an MS attack or MS exacerbation. Once you deliver, however, or postpartum, that's when you begin to have an issue, more often than not, in that first 90 days. 
So we usually recommend that unless you're going to breastfeed, that you potentially probably want to start something more immediate than not. Even though with the Copaxone, it's reported to be safe in breastfeeding as well. But most people don't want to give their little one Copaxone, at least not intentionally. Now, like I said before, there are some medications that are once every five years. There are some that are once every six months. And once again, if you're a traveler, individual who is moving about a great deal, individual who knows that you're not the most compliant, so something that says every day, every other day, you're not going to do that. But once every six months, that I can do. So once again, the idea is to identify something that works for you as a plan, as a methodology that makes sense in your care. And so ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, what you want to do is identify that healthcare provider that you're comfortable with. And then you want to identify a circumstance, a medication and treatment that you're comfortable with. You are comfortable with also the MS itself. You have identified your particular type. You know how significant it is. You know where your lesions are located. Ideally, he or she has shown those to you. And so now you have your team. You're moving forward. And that's the idea. Each of the medications can be changed from one to another. Sometimes there's a gap in terms of a clearing period of time from one dose to the next when you change your medications. But the bottom line is, and the point is, is that you're never stuck with a medication. When we started years and years ago, when there was only one MS medication and then two and so forth, it was different. But now that we have well over 10, well over 12 or so, it's actually a much simpler, much easier process at this point in time. So therefore, not a problem anymore like it once was in the years past. Okay. Once you've decided on that physician, you've decided on that healthcare provider, you've decided on the location, you've decided on your treatment plan, you're pretty much there. You're now monitoring for that list of symptoms I mentioned to you earlier in terms of discomfort, pain, weakness, numbness, thinking issues or concerns, movement issues or concern, handwriting consequences, changes, speaking issues, swallowing issues, urination issues, sexual dysfunction issues, all these things you are sort of monitoring on your own. Your, your witness is monitoring them with you as well. And for a lot of you, they don't occur. They don't repeat themselves again. And for a lot of you, they will. It's very variable, very different. We also do know, too, that there are ethnic as well as gender differences when it comes to multiple sclerosis. And so how one group responds to medication and how one gender responds to medication is not always the same. And these are things we're learning as time progresses. We're also looking at the fact that as we mature, as in 70 plus, that MS may require a change in treatment plan, a change in how that person is managed, potentially. So once again, all these things are taken into consideration because we're learning on the job because you have to remember that the oldest MS medication is still less than 30 years old, which means that if someone first start taking their first FDA-approved MS medication and they were 18, per se, they're now 48. If they were 28, they're now 58. So my point being is that patients are now entering the 50, 60, 70 years of age range on a disease modifying therapy for the first time. And so we're seeing what happens in that group. And as we well know, as we mature, our immune system doesn't work as well as it used to. So then do you still need to place them on a chronic immunosuppressive, like an MS drug? Once again, these are debates, these are concerns, these are questions that are coming up on a routine basis. And you're discussing it with your haircut provider. Huh. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, what questions do you have for me? When you find a someone who has no evidence of disease, what is your philosophy as far as that goes? Okay. The question coming as you guys heard is basically is that if individuals followed, they present to the doctor and it's telling him or her that I feel the same, nothing's changed, the MRI is done, the MRI looks the same, unchanged as well, they do the examination, the examination, when you compare to the previous examination, looks the same as well, what do you do? 
If that individual is, say, less than 70, and that individual is on X medication, they're reporting no side effects to speak of, you tend to stay the course. The reason for that is that the assumption is, is that the medication and you are working well together, and the combination that was chosen for you is working for your immune system to the point that you are stable. So you tend to stay the course. Question here. Uh, your talk was very informative. Thank you so much. My question is, do you think that they will come out with another medication for primary progressive MS? The question coming out, as you guys heard, focuses primarily on primary progressive MS. Let me give you a little backstory. He mentioned another. So all the medications that are FDA approved to date for multiple sclerosis have been focused primarily on remitting relapsing MS, which is 85% of all MS patients. As of March of this year, for the first time, there's actually a medication FDA approved to treat primary progressive MS. And so the question is, will there be more? I believe there will be, but I think it'll, it'll still fall after more medications for remitting relapsing, but will there be others? Yes, sir. I think so. I understand that a medication choice involves some personal decisions, but are there any biomarkers that will tell one what the best medication will be for their particular situation? The question to comment, guys, is about this phenomenal idea of biomarkers. I, I love it. Thank you. What are biomarkers? What do I mean by that? What does she mean by that? The idea is this. You present to that healthcare provider, that neurologist ideally. And you have your own personal concerns. You know what you want, you know what you wanna do, but someone has done research, had done a study, or num a number of studies, and they've identified that if you are marker A positive, that medication YZ24 work for you. If, you're, if you are in fact marker B, positive, then they know that this drug, this drug, that drug work for you. And so then when you sit down before that health provider and you're a marker B plus, a little A minus, if that's another marker, and so forth, the idea is that your choices are more restricted, but it's based on clinical evidence or research evidence that this group is more likely to work for you versus the standard we use now is more of a trial and error and experience is what we use presently. Not to say that it always misses, but we are using trial and error. While that would eliminate to some degree that aspect of it. And so important. And so ideally we should be getting closer to the idea of the biomarker. Great question, thank you. Next question. If uh, someone has uh, MS uh, for a year and has uh, all the regular symptoms, and then for some reason, there's no symptoms for 10 or 15 years, and then it comes back. In those 10 or 15 years, what's happening to your body as far as MS? The credit comment, guys, is that the person had a very active period, then a very prolonged inactive period, and then active again. So it depends. So if you're talking about a patient that was on medication and that happened to them, the assumption would be that they were active, their medication was in place at least three to six months, they went inactive as it should have, and then something changed for them and became active again. So that's one assumption. The other one is that they were on nothing, and maybe they in fact had a period of time where their own natural immune system made it go inactive. It's harder to say because Keep in mind, if they were also being monitored by MRI, even though they were feeling great for this prolonged period of time, radiographically, they may in fact have been having new lesions occur, just not one in a critical area that gave them a symptom. So it really sort of depends on the remainder of that story in terms of the right answer. Thank you. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. What's your view on a complementary therapy named marijuana? <laughs> Good question, because it comes up at least every clinic. <laughs> the question coming, guys, is about marijuana. As it stands today, there's no clear evidence that it affects the immune system in such a way that it directly affects 
MS and turn it to disease itself. Now, it is commonplace that individuals would mention to me, well, but doc, I feel better. I feel good. <laughs> I'm sure they're right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's doing a great thing for your EMS. It may be doing a great thing for you otherwise. So right now, guys, there is no clear evidence that it directly affects the disease itself. So from that point of view, I don't think it's necessarily beneficial. But, I mean, there's something to be said for feeling better as a whole. For most places, at least for South Carolina, it's not a legal thing that you can do. Um, but I suspect over the years, it would get sort of approved nationally, I suspect, over time. With that, more wide use, more research, more distinctive research, and we, in fact, may have an answer that says it may, in fact, directly affect the disease in a positive way, because a number of people really believe it to be true. They could be right. We just don't have any objective evidence to confirm it at this point in time. I'll be there in a moment. How important do you think it is for people to be diagnosed with a particular kind of MS, and are those labels changing? The question and comment is, the types. I saw that slide earlier, remitting relapsing, which can become secondary progressive. There is progressive relapsing and then prior progressive. The first part of that. So are the labels going to change? Probably, to be honest with you. Are they helpful as it stands right now? It is because the medications that are FDA approved to treat remitting relapsing thus far have not really statistically shown any dramatic benefits as a general rule to people that have primary progressives. So it really doesn't make a big difference there. One could debate secondary progressives since those folks were originally remitting relapsing and then progressive relapsing, people don't see it enough to really get an answer for. So the basic group difference that we see is remitting relapsing, primary progressive, and primary progressive the remitting relapsing medications don't make a big difference overall. The exception would be the newest addition, which treats both groups, remitting relapsing and then as well PP, MS. I have a question in a continuation of what Stuart asked regarding marijuana. Yes. What about CBD oil, which is a derivative of marijuana but without the THC? So, first part, correction, there is THC in DBO, tiny component. It's just like non-alcoholic beer, it has alcohol in it, right? That all does too. However, the amount is not thought to be substantial enough to give you a euphoria, so to speak. As far as I know, still the same rule applies. We know that it makes a difference in children with a certain type of epilepsy type where it slows down their seizures. No question about that. But we haven't seen that kind of evidence in the world of MS. And in theory, if the, if the two conditions have some kind of correlation, they don't, then it necessarily wouldn't because the problem in that, in that child or that population is very different. It's a metabolic issue with those epilepsy. So, but once again, it's still early. We may still learn something more about that, but as it stands right now, we don't have no evidence to say that it makes a difference. Objective anyway, evidence. Great, one moment. Getting there. I, got it. I, got it. I had a question about um, older people over 70, as you were talking about. I said mature. <laughs> um, have any of these medications been tested with people for people over 70? Okay, good question. So the question coming, guys, is age in MS. Has anyone been tested? So answer your question is yes, but when an MS study is developed, the age range that is used is 18 to 50 or 18 to 55. So the large studies that got these medications, FDA approved to treat multiple sclerosis, did not include individuals over 50 or over 55. Smaller studies have included that in those individuals, but because it's a smaller group, the number of patients are being, being reduced, you don't seem to have the same impact numbers. And so because of that, we don't have as clear-cut evidence 
for the older populations as to how well it's necessarily going to work with them and then what effect it's going to have with their immune system as the immune, immune system ages. So that data is not as clear cut as it used to be, or we thought it would be. But those studies are springing up all over the place. So we're learning, if you will. But the basic MS studies only included people who were 18 to 50 or 18, 18 to 55. Well, since you're not dealing with folks over 70, but you do have hundreds of patients. Yes. And over the period of time, especially in the last uh, 30 years, there's a huge emphasis in people getting MS, a lot more people having MS. But I don't ever hear anybody dying from MS. So we hear of dying, you know, someone have a, maybe it's their heart dying or their lungs are a problem. But do people die from MS? The question coming is, do individuals die from MS? They certainly die with MS, but in terms of dying from, as a routine, you don't actually die from it. What it can do, though, if you have some of the latter stages of it and you're less mobile, and so you're laying on your backside, per se, majority of the day, you're predisposed to, per se, bed sores, infected, major infection, pass away, that kind of thing. You have difficulty swallowing, and so you still insist on consuming fluids or eating foods, and then you put food into your lungs, a significant pneumonia, and it, can, it festers, if you will, and then dying from that. And it's, but it does not affect major organs. It does not affect, as a mass, heart, lungs as a general rule, unless there's an aspiration problem, kidneys, and so forth. So as a general rule, you're 100% correct, is that MS in and of itself does not actually kill individuals, but it can set you up to where that could happen. Tell me a little bit more about the aspiration problems. Is this common with people with MS? So the question coming, guys, is, is it common? Yes, it is. And basically, guys, basically, guys, the idea is this, is that the process of eating, which we, on a routine basis, take for granted. Imagine, if you will, if you had to think of it in process, meaning that, okay, so I'm going to lift it up from the table. That's the first part. Should I cut it into squares, circles, just fragment it? So you got to decide that first. So you fragment it. That's a decision. Then when I, when I put the fork in it, am I going to bring it at a right angle or a left angle or just obtuse angle? Okay, so you decide that. You place it between the lips. Now, should I go straight in, right in, left in, middle in? Decisions. You decide to go middle in. You place it in the mouth. Tongue should be out in, left, right, middle. You decide middle on top. Now, what am I going to do? I'm going to lift it up, move it around. I should put teeth on it, because my mom said I had to do that. 25 times or some sort of number thing. So I'm counting. So I put it in right cheek, left cheek. Let's go right, I like right. Let's go right cheek. I'm chewing on it, okay. Now, big decision. It's time to sink it. Let's center down. But in order to do that, there's a structure back there called the epiglottis. It's gotta lift up just right. If it doesn't, it goes into my lung. So I'm going to send a message to Epiglottis, do the right thing. Oh, you know what? It's, it's automatic. I don't get to do that. Hmm. So you send it back there, and you're hoping that it goes in the right place. How do you know? You know because when it goes down, there's no cough. I win. If it goes down, and uh, 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 you lose. Because that means that it actually was attempting to go down the windpipe instead. And so the evaluation for this is typically a swallowing study, important to you, speech therapist, all that sort of thing to assist you in it. But it is a common dramatic issue, guys, I'm going to tell you. I have a patient now who's losing, has lost a substantial amount of weight because he doesn't swallow well any longer. We often think that swallowing the solid is more difficult than swallowing liquid because it's liquid, it should go okay. Well, the truth of the matter is liquids are actually more likely to go into your lungs than solids because a solid you can manipulate with your tongue up, down, and around easily. 
with a liquid, when you put it back there, it's a matter of angle, gravity, and it goes where it wants. And so you tend to choke on the liquids. So we often will put something in it called thicket to make it more solid, if you will, so then you regain control in order to put it in the right location. But and often a major circumstance, a major difficulty. And then also the vocal cords back there as well, and if they are affected because of the MS, then you become more hoarse, mute, can't speak, and so forth, as well as part of that equation. But the difficulty, guys, in swallowing is going to be difficult and complex. For those individuals that have had MS so long that they have been on most of the drugs, and they get to a point based on their age, the doctor tell them that it, the medication may not be helpful to them anymore. Where do you go from there? <laughs> the critical comment, okay. So you had sort of two parts to that. One, running out of medicines, and then you use the word aging, okay. With there being between 12 and 14 or so, depending on how you count them, medications, no one has used them all. What happens, though, is that some of them are similar to one another, and you decide, or it's decided, not necessarily you, that, well, if I take this class and I get flu-like symptoms and body ache, the other three, four would do the same thing, so I'm going to go that one and get rid of all those. You could be right, you could be wrong, because they're all different, but that's what often will happen. But once you have gone through them all by class or by means of administration, and you decide that what you want to do is then opt out or opt for an alternative, that sometimes happens. So prior to the FDA-approved MS medications, there were a number of other medicines that were used, things like Imuran, methotrexate, cytoxan, and so forth. These medications are still available. They are now classed as sort of non-traditional because they're not FDA approved, but there is significant evidence that they work. Some people will actually get plasma phoresis where your blood is removed and is filtered. That is a technique that also works as well. Some will get sometimes IVIG, so my point to young man is that there's still a number of other techniques out there to treat that patient. There are people still out there who get what we call pulse steroids, where uh, interval time passes by and they get steroids. Interval time passes by and they get steroids and that seems to help them as well. So the different techniques, different methodologies, but for the FDA approved stuff, folks can run out of that or to become ineffective, but there are still other means you can use as well. Um, I have heard you say that um, MS is a young person's disease. Could you expound on that for me, please? Okay. I'm not sure I said that, but I understand. So, as a general rule, the highest incidence of being diagnosed in terms of likelihood is a person who's in the 25 to 20 to 29 age range. That's the peak of it. Once you get into your high 40s and 50 plus, that is a much rare, unusual age to have onset of MS. Is where that sort of comes from. Granted, I've diagnosed a person who's over 50. It happens. It is infrequent that it happens. And sometimes what happens is that you see that person is 50 plus, he or she would have an MRI that is, my goodness, a ton of lesions. They just chose not to seek medical assistance. It's often what you will see. Not always, by no means. But certainly, the peak is in the mid-30s. Mid okay, because I thought maybe it had to do with the, you're taking your meds sooner might prevent. Oh, I see. Uh, so her question was, her concern was that the issue around taking your medication sooner than later. Right, so that is a truism, meaning that Individuals 19, diagnosed with MS, taking the medications consistently, adhering to, and it's the right medicine for them, side effects is minimal, a lesser issue, how well would they do? Most do well when you do that. They're assuming everything else works out, in terms of side effects and so forth. But if you're on the older side, but new, new diagnosis, and you, can, and you adhere to your medications as well, the issue you run into there is that that patient group statistically does not do as well. 
something because of onset, late onset, maybe a different disorder, a different degree of disorder. Those are sort of debates, if you will. But most people are on a younger side of things. Question back here. I believe you said that typically people do not die from MS. Correct. And that they might die from complications. complications. Correct. Does it decrease life expectancy? There is reported one, that's right. And that was based on data that predates the first FDA approved medication. So therefore, back then they would say that your I expect it would reduce by seven years, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. But you really don't see much of that anymore in, in modern day. I mean, people are now reaching their 70s and generally healthy. And if they have issues, as mentioned earlier, it's their heart. It's some, it's some other organ independent of the medication. But yes, ma'am, historically we were taught that your lifespan was shortened by 7, 12, 15 years. Correct. How about diets? How do you feel about diets in MS such as the Mediterranean diet? So the diets themselves, when you look at them in detail, more often than not, they basically have you reducing your fat intake per se. They have you basically eating healthy. As a general well-being, that's what you should do. It's what we all should do, MS or not. And so this particular diet, I personally have reviewed it to some degree. It seems fine. I mean, it's, it's, but from my point of view overall, it's no different than any, any other, meaning that as long as you eat healthy, balanced, you tend to do well, period. New question. Stem cells. Ah, stem cells. So many people, you know, think that they could just hop on a plane and go to Santo Domingo or Mexico or Russia and get this done. So why don't you let them all know the truth behind that? Uh, yeah. So guys, so stem cell, it, it is, it comes up at least once or twice a week in clinic. So stem cells. It is a methodology that in theory should cure you. We haven't seen it happen yet, but it should, because you have some this group of cells that you can manipulate that becomes whatever it's been programmed to become. So the idea is kind of cool. The problem you run into is that it has become in recent times, maybe it always was, but definitely in recent times, this huge money maker. Because classically, insurance doesn't pay for things that are considered investigational or experimental. So therefore, it's cash. And so you're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars per treatment. And a number of different places are offering this. And the thing is, in modern day, stem cell origin can be your own skin cells to fetal, if you will. Very few are fetal anymore because of just the concerns and issues around that sort of technique and population of source, if you will. And so a lot of folks are getting it from skin and other tissues which aren't as viable, aren't as necessarily effective, and so therefore that has its own issues in success, if there's gonna be such a thing as success. And from my, my particular patient clientele, we've not seen anyone who's done it that's been successful, but that's just my group of patients. It, can, it has nothing to do with the natural technique and others that might actually have a positive outcome from it. But the key thing is that know what you're purchasing and make sure that the standards that you're flying into are equal to that of the United States because a lot of these places don't have defined rules. So you don't necessarily know what's in that bag in that IV being infused into your body necessarily. You know what was said to be that, but you don't necessarily know that. So once again, these are the concerns that you need to have, particularly when you're dealing with cash and this much cash. Do we have any other questions? I know it's getting late. Well, that being said, I want to thank Dr. Walker for coming, coming here, here today. today. Thank you very much. And I hope that you all enjoyed what he spoke about because this was far different than you probably have heard in the past with programs over the last few years, always talking about the medications. This was great. I'm glad we gave you these topics to talk about. Thank you.